Constable Calvin Byer, who is a community constable with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and also Dr. Henry Bishop from the Black Culture Center. He's the CEO there, but he is also an ancestral drummer. So I ask that you remain seated for the processional so that everybody can see uh, our head table guests as they come in. And then we will stand for the singing of the national anthem.
will have our opening prayer and grace by our vice moderator, Reverend O'Wherry O'Hara. Our Father and our God, we assemble here tonight mindful that you are sovereign over all. As we gather here this evening, we are very mindful also of all this who were here before us, who paved the way for us. This song is a song of faith and a song of hope. And we have come indeed a long way. We didn't get here by ourselves. And so we acknowledge, O oh God, that you have been there for us, for our people, through all the ups and downs and all the difficulties. Today we come here thankful for a mighty way you brought us. There are others, O oh God, who should be here that are not here. And so we pause to remember them and their service to you and to your church and to this community. They toiled and they labored, and today they rest comfortably in your hands. And so as we gather here, we remember even the spouses they've left behind who are here with us. We pray, O oh God, that your presence, your comforting presence here will be here amongst us. And now to all of us who are here in person, your servants, your spouses, as we gather here to pay tribute to them and to recognize, O oh God, your service to you and to your church, we pray that this little token of our appreciation for the work they've done will inspire even those of us who are still here and future generations will continue to work. So we pray this evening that, O oh God, your presence will be round about them for those many, many years that they served in the parishes and they worked. That even tonight, in a special way, they will feel that all their labors and their work is not in vain, even though it took us this time to recognize them. And so the rest of the evening we hand over to you. We've come from far and wide, black and white, together in this place tonight. We ask, O oh God, that you bless our gathering together and be with us here to remind us again that it is you who continues to strengthen us for this service. Now we give you thanks and praise for everything you've done what you're yet to do, as this association moves forward, we know, O oh God, that we can only grow to new spiritual heights and strength. Now receive all our praise and our thanks for all that you've done. We now offer praise and thanks to you for the food that is prepared for our bodies. Help us, O oh God, as we partake of it, to offer you thanks from our heart. As we look around our world, we know there's so many need so much pain but we, this evening may we have the opportunity to just be thankful for what we have for we owe it all to you bless the food and bless us to your service for we ask it all in the precious name of our lord and savior jesus christ the one who has made it all possible that we have in here tonight the reverend dr peter paris and next to dr paris is Mrs. Jean Clayton. Next to Mrs. Clayton is her husband, Reverend Dr. Willard Clayton. And next to Dr. Clayton is Mrs. Simons. Mrs. Sharon Simons. And next to Sister Sharon is her husband, Reverend Calvin Simons. Pastors, members of the convention, brothers and sisters, um, um, as I look out over the crowd, it's exciting to see the numbers who have come out tonight to honor and pay tribute to our retired pastors and our senior pastors and their spouses and um, the spouses of our deceased pastors that are here tonight. Um, Mrs. Uh, Thomas is with us. And um, I just want to give a Christian welcome to each and every one and just say how honored I am to be here for this 150th banquet, at which time we are taking time to um, recognize our pastors who have contributed so much to our association. And um, because without them, we wouldn't be here today. 
And so I just thank God for their lives and their wives that stood behind them for the years that they um, put into the association and worked so hard. And so on behalf of the executive members, I welcome you all to this, our opening 150th banquet, and just um, ask you to pray for us as we go into deliberations this weekend that um, the head of our church may be with us and guide us throughout this time. Have a good evening, all. Um, our guest speakers. Our honorees tonight is Reverend Dr. Donald Fairfax. At this time, we're going to call on two of our guests. Um, Sister Rose Frazier and her husband Alexander to do their first number while dinner, perhaps we'll wait and let the salad be served first and then following that. <laughs>
and he plays other instruments as well. And uh, I think that we need to continue to support him, to commend his family and his community who surround him. And uh, we can show it again by giving him a round of applause. Gospel singing sang the song and they wrote the lyrics, I believe, and one of the, the um, it goes something like this, anything good ever come out of North Preston. And we keep seeing it revealed over and over and over again. And so we give God all the praise and all the glory. On the other side, um, you've probably seen one of our pastors leave. Uh, Reverend Wallace Smith. And it's not to be alarmed, but he has been called on an emergency. And so I would ask that we would be in prayer for him wherever he goes, that God would be with him and with them. Is the dinner good? Pardon? Is the dinner good? Yeah. So I think that they deserve it, and other things will be coming along in a little while. So continue to converse and enjoy each other. Um, you know, we have beautiful programs that are on your um, table. I want you to make sure that you take a good look at them and uh, remember to take them home with you. But you know, a lot of praise and credit goes to uh, Sister Kathleen Odesanya, who has done a tremendous
Dr. Uh, Nelson is our guest speaker this weekend, but we know that God is going to direct his path and he will be here. So we're just going to keep the prayers going up and uh, we will be blessed. Um, also, a lot of work has been done by our regional minister, uh, Reverend Mutali, and the others who have assisted him in putting together a commemorative booklet. Now, there's a lot of history in this booklet. And guess what? You could own it for a very nominal fee of $10. That's all it is, just $10. A lot of the history of our AUBA, pictures of the pastors and of all of the churches of our great African United Baptist Association of Nova Scotia, our great African United Baptist Association. I said our great And you know what? We may have some pimples and wrinkles, but you know, we're all right. <laughs> because we're carrying God's word here in God. So continue to enjoy. I'll come back and bug you again a little later on. Well, it's the fact that we have two regional ministers with us this evening. Um, we have Dr. Frank Gwenta, Jr. And um, we also have our own area regional minister. Um, there he is. Over there, Reverend Elias Mutali. In addition, we are blessed to have a <coughs> civic um, representative, uh, Mr. Keith Caldwell and his beautiful wife, Elizabeth. Keith was the uh, county counselor in the Preston area and has recently been elected MLA, Preston Riding, and he is representing the mayor, Peter Kelly, tonight. So we welcome you as well. I'm going to give you not a full introduction of our guest speaker, but I'm going to just give you a synopsis. I know that you can read about him later on yourself because we have quite uh, a bit of information in your program. But I don't think that it's fear that he is a homeboy. He's from Nova Scotia, New Glasgow, in fact. But we are so proud of him and it's really an honor to have him come back here uh, to celebrate this 150th anniversary of the African Baptist Association with us. And uh, especially at a time when we are honoring our senior pastors. Dr. Peter J. Paris has been the Elmer G. Homer-Kalsen Professor of Christian Social Ethics in Princeton, at the Princeton Theological Seminary since 1985. Prior to coming to Princeton, he taught on the faculties of Vanderbilt University Divinity School, excuse me, in Nashville, Tennessee, and at Howard University School of Divinity in Washington, D.C. He was born and brought up in Nova Scotia, Canada, where he earned his BA and his Master of Divinity degrees at Acadia University. After having worked for several years with the Student Christian Movement of Canada and Nigeria, he earned his Master of Arts and his PhD degrees at the University of Chicago, which honored him as alumnus of the year in 1995. He has been a recipient of honorary doctoral degrees from Acadia University, his alma mater, McGill University, La Haye University, and Lafayette College, and he has published extensively. We're really pleased to know that Peter has also been very active with the youth in our African United Baptist Association, where I believe he even served as a provincial president at one time. He presently serves as the principal project director of a multi-year Pan-African seminar of religious scholars of religion and poverty, which is funded by the Ford Foundation. 
Dr. Harris has lectured and preached widely throughout Canada, the United States, Nigeria, Ghana, and South Africa. And so after hearing from our guests, again, uh, brother, we call him Stoney, and Rose, then you will hear from none other than our guest speaker of the evening, Brother Dr. Peter Gavis. While they're coming forward, I think it's proper to say also that Rose and Alexander have been ministers in music for many, many years. They also are from the community of North President, St. Thomas United Baptist Church. And we remember them as being part of the uh, gospel airs, and they minister in music as a couple. It's not too often that we see married couples going out into the world and ministering. And so they certainly are role models and
Jesus. By and by, Lord, when the morning comes, you can help us just join in and sing along.
Executive, distinguished honorees, esteemed clergy, and members and friends of the AMBA. No greater honor has befallen me than that of being invited to address you on this historic occasion. I shall always be indebted to you for this great privilege. When I read the biographies of those who are being honored, it seemed abundantly clear that none of them was born with silver spoons in their mouths. Rather, each was destined to overcome enormous obstacles, and that has made their accomplishments all the more impressive. Most important, their accomplishments emerged out of their dedicated service to God and the well-being of their respective communities. And thus they have been models of excellence in this association. And we are grateful to God that they are here tonight to receive this recognition. It is It is altogether fitting that this 150th celebration of the African United Baptist Association should begin with a dinner honoring its elders in the ministry. It is also fitting that this anniversary celebration is being held in Preston, a place whose name honors that of our founding ancestor, known in his day as Father Richard Preston. <laughs> After his ordination in London in 1831, because no white Baptist church in Nova Scotia would ordain him, he returned to this province and became the founder and pastor of the Baptist Church in Preston. His leadership eventually led to the formation of the AUBA, which demonstrated one of the principal goals of African peoples everywhere, namely their natural desire for community, to be together. Community is the fundamental requirement of human nature. Without it, we perish. All humans need community, and community begins in the nuclear family, expands to include the expand, extended family, and gradually the village and beyond. Unfortunately, 150 years ago, the evil of white racism severely proscribed the entire life of African peoples in Nova Scotia, in the United States, the Caribbean, and everywhere. That is to say, our African ancestors were completely isolated by social, political, and economic barriers that blocked all their strivings for a viable life. In fact, throughout the 19th century and more than half of the 20th century, our people lived under very oppressive conditions. Racial discrimination and segregation guaranteed insecure jobs, low wages, unsanitary working conditions, substandard housing, lack of heat, clothing, medical care, malnutrition, all of which greatly diminish the quality of their lives, to say nothing of their life expectancy. 
Yet by some miracle, a miracle that the churches trusted and celebrated, our people did not perish as the social conditions would imply. Rather, they gradually built a world of their own, much like the Hebrews of old who made brick without straw. As a, as a sign of their enduring faith in a gracious and caring God and their gratitude for survival, they built churches in each of the local areas where they settled. And in those sacred places, they prayed together, they sang the songs that they brought with them out of slavery, and they celebrated the goodness of the Lord in a hostile land. Similar conditions and prejudices and discriminations had driven an earlier group of Africans from these shores to Sierra Leone in 1792. And for years later, others left behind were tempted to accept invitations to go to Trinidad and other places in the Caribbean. But Richard Preston and others persuaded them to stay and to make their homes on these rugged shores. And ironically, while the white community downrated black schools and black churches, our African ancestors viewed them positively because they were the only life-affirming resources that our people had. The uniqueness of their churches and schools and homes was that their primary orientation was to serve the well-being of our people. And that was their primary orientation. And no one else around them would give that as their primary focus. Apart from these institutions, we would not have survived. I have been amazed by many things just here tonight. One thing that has amazed me is that we counted, Mrs. Clayton and I, and maybe we've left out someone, we counted seven women who are ordained in this association. That is a change for the good. And it wasn't so 50 years ago when I and others attended the centennial celebration. And hopefully by the time of the bicentennial, we will be at least 50% men and women in the clergy. The other thing that has impressed me just in these few moments is that the AUBA is a pan-African association. And that is to say that African leadership comes from the continent of Africa, from Africans in Canada and the United States and the Caribbean. If we can be permitted to add Guyana as part of the Caribbean. Yes, sir. <laughs> And these are, these are changes yeah. for the good. And for a small association in this part of the world to be so pan-African is a wonder to behold. Amen. Both in the past and in the present, our churches constitute the center of our community's life, both spiritually and socially. In fact, the centrality of the churches in the black community gained primacy because they nurtured and preserved the community's most cherished moral and religious values. 
And so it is right and proper that we celebrate this notable history and tell this story from generation to generation. A favorite hymn that our congregation used to sing in the church in Nashville, Tennessee, comes to mind as a fitting commentary on our people's sojourn. We have come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in His holy word. Richard Preston saw the need for the black community to expand beyond their local environments to a province-wide association. And thus the creation of the AUBA met that need so well that we are presently celebrating this anniversary 150 years later. Truly this has been a wonderful, miraculous accomplishment. And given the conditions under which it was formed, truly miraculous. Most important, it became a symbol of the racist empowerment as a whole and a beacon of hope for each future generation. Let none forget that we were stolen from our native Africa and we were sold on the auction block like cattle to the highest bidder. Know that our enslavement was the work of the, confined, the combined forces of greedy Europeans and Americans on the demand side of the trade and greedy Africans on the supply side. It wasn't just whites who brought us into slavery, but blacks on, in Africa control the supply side. And they are the ones who raided the villages and brought the Africans uh, to the coast for the white ships to take them abroad. And thus the most bitter experience that African peoples in the diaspora can have is to visit the forts at Cape Coast and Elmina in Ghana and Gori Island in Senegal. And as you go down into the dungeons, where thousands were warehoused, waiting for the ships to arrive, one seems to feel the spirits of our ancestors still sorrowing in those dreadful, dark, damp places that were once polluted with the waste of the sick and the dying. For a long while, African taxi and bus drivers could not understand why so many of the Africans from the diaspora would emerge from those dungeons crying. After learning about the active role that their ancestors had played in the slave trade, many of them now weep also. Finally, the horror of that experience is made even worse by the fact that above the dungeons stands a church. Apparently, the slave traders worshipped in the midst of the moans and groans of the enslaved Africans in the dungeons below, separated only by the wood floor. Abruptly cut off from the communal life of family and village, we can now rejoice that African slaves maintained their humanity by holding on to their family and religious values and by creating their own communities wherever they could. During slavery, they had to do so in secret. And severe punishments 
and maimings and torture befell them if they were caught. In Nova Scotia, they did so in the segregated spaces they were allowed to occupy. And despite their political and economic impoverishment, the communities that our ancestors built were valuable and enduring cultural entities, the most prominent legacy of which is the AUBA. <laughs> Father Richard Preston was a formidable leader. In addition to founding churches and the AUBA, he also founded the Negro Abolitionist Society mm -hmm. in 1846, and he remained in close contact with other abolitionist societies in Boston and elsewhere. He used everything he could muster for the moral and religious development of his people. And yet, despite the energetic advocacy of, that he rendered for the abolition of slavery and the support later for the temperance movement, during most of the 20th century, the conditions were not right for the AUBA to be a strong advocate for social justice. As we move now from the 150th mark to the bicentennial, the challenge of the 21st century is that the AUBA and its member churches Right. guided by the accomplishments of the past mm -hmm. and with a bright hope for the future, now choose to give paramount importance to the goal of empowerment. Mm. Evidence of this is already apparent in the educational achievements that this present generation of young adults has achieved. Amen. If these educated young professionals are to remain active members in our churches, then our churches will need to listen to their needs and discern effective means towards addressing them. Our communities Our communities cannot be empowered in the 21st century if we leave these young, educated professionals behind. Let us resolve not to do so. Let us resolve to do everything in our power to maintain them in the fold. But we cannot do that just by telling them that they must come with us. We must listen to them and find out why it is that they are not with us. And listen carefully. They will tell us and then we will have our agenda. An exception needs to be made, however, on this issue of advocacy for social justice. When we think of the Reverend Dr. W.P. Oliver, whose ministry was characterized by a strong sense of advocacy, both from within and from without our community. Dr. Oliver was a mentor to many of us here tonight, including myself. From within the community, he began by advocating the necessity of our churches becoming financially independent of the Maritime Baptist Convention, which AUBA had joined in 1904, largely for the financial assistance that it could receive from such an affiliation. Appreciation of the assistance that our churches had received from the convention, Dr. Oliver believed that the time had come for our churches to become financially independent 
because neither empowerment nor dignity can come from dependent mm -hmm. relationships. Mm -hmm. And so he and our mother church, Cornwallis Baptist, modeled the way by becoming the first of all of our churches to gain their independence. And in a very short while, all had become independent. And what a wonderful accomplishment that was. Right. <laughs> that was a prophetic act of the first order. And AUBA will always be indebted to Dr. Oliver for that and many other great works that he accomplished. Clearly no good thing happened for our people for over 50 years from 1937 onwards that Dr. Oliver was not at the helm. No fitting remembrance of him, however, is yet in place, either by the AUBA or by the province of Nova Scotia. I say no fitting remembrance of him is yet in place. And that's sort of a challenge. And the challenge is how might we provide for a fitting remembrance of this particular ancestor? In addition to faith and hope, which the AUBA has in abundance, it is now being called, the AUBA is now being called, to nurture and develop the virtue of courage in order to take some unpopular prophetic stands on issues affecting the well-being of our peoples. Once again, I say, our churches need to read the prophets Amos and Micah Hosea and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and others in order to become aware of what is needed to become a prophetic voice for social justice. Once again we are being called to establish a greater balance between our pastoral and prophetic ministries. In the late 60s and early 70s, our churches accepted that challenge and its advocacy resulted in social change. Those changes included um, the Black United Front, the Black Cultural Center for Nova Scotia, the Black Educators Association, various community centers, to mention only a few. And I apologize for those that should be mentioned, and I have not been able to remember them. All those who have received university degrees in the past 20 years should know that they are the beneficiaries of the work of these organizations that were begun and inspired in large part by the support of the churches. When I went to university in 1952, I was the only black Canadian um, in the university in Nova Scotia at that time. I was soon joined by another and then a few others. Um, and so we could count on the fingers of one hand the number of blacks who had gained degrees, and less than one hand the number of blacks who gained degrees in fields other than religion. The challenge of the 21st century it's for AUBA to evaluate its accomplishments, to assess the needs of its people,
to determine the necessary resources needed to address, to address those needs and to take the initiative once again in leading our communities to the next level of accomplishment and empowerment. It is not sufficient for us to rest on our laurels and to simply celebrate and go on celebrating past accomplishments. But rather, we must now move forward and build on that. And we must have courage in order to embrace the necessary changes that must come about. You know, as well as I do, that all living forms must change. I was here 50 years ago, and I have changed. <laughs> Those of you who were here 50 years ago, uh, you have changed as well. And that's a sign of life. Organizations have got to change. But churches are the slowest to change. And often when churches are challenged to change, there's tremendous resistance to the change. I've spent a long time reading minutes of churches in Canada and in the United States and elsewhere, various parts of Africa as well. And it is interesting, when you read the minutes of the associations and the conventions and the conferences, if you read those in 1890 and you read them in 1950 and you read them in 2001, they are all exactly the same. <laughs> and what was going on at 10 o'clock in the morning in 1890 has been going on at 10 o'clock in the morning forever. And that is evidence of the miraculous work of the Lord that he can use, <laughs> or that God can use, um, such, uh, such organizations that are trying desperately to die. <laughs> because that's what's involved if you resist change, you are trying to die. Okay? I don't think I need to say any more about that. With gratitude to the faithfulness of all those who have led us in the past and inspired by all they were able to accomplish, those who are no longer with us in the flesh, and those whom we honor here tonight, and those of you who will remember at the time of the bicentennial that you were here tonight. Because some of you will be here, and some of you will be clergy, and will continue to be. I challenge you to do all in your power, to muster everything that you have in your spirit and your energies, to help the association to move forward with a renewed vision, a renewed resolve, and a renewed initiative, trusting always in the God of our ancestors to remain with us always. May God bless you always.
in this office. It's um, an extra pleasure for me to have a family member be a guest speaker. It makes sense. Um, you have taken us back. You have made us remember from whence we came and also challenge us to where we need to go. And it is my prayer as well that we will listen to our youth, start to address some of the issues that are deeply affecting our AUBA and our AUBA churches as individuals and as a collective. And I just thank God for your message tonight and that you were here to give us because son of the association and a native of New Boston, uh, that message came through it. So God bless you.